Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. You know, right now, spring can seem like a distant dream, but it's in the fall that we plant the cool weather bulbs that will grab our attention in just a few months. Today, Chris Weisinger of the Southern Bulb Company shows off some of the drought tolerant bulbs that will naturalize for you and return for many years to come. On tour, let's meet the next generation of gardeners who found new wonder through bulbs. What do plants need to grow? Anybody know? Water. Yes. Water. Water. Dirt. 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 Flowers. Flowers. And yes, ma'am. At the Lucy Ree Pre-Kindergarten Demonstration School, the Texas Flower Bulb Society, a club associated with Zilker Botanical Garden, helps the next generation get growing. So let's cover them up. Very good. Danny Fowler, one of the club's charter members, wanted to give back some of the joy he's found in growing bulbs. I think I'm attracted to bulbs, flowering bulbs, because the difference between the bulb and the flower is so extreme that transformation is so distinct between what you plant and what you get, uh, that it's that sort of transformational process that I, I find just absolutely intriguing. And I think it applies to a lot of different things in life. To connect young minds to how things grow, the Texas Flower Bulb Society started the Eager Program. With funds from their bulb sales at Zilker and personal donations, they give children the chance to plant their very own bulbs. You can just scoop up, just like that. Our motto is eager to learn, eager to grow. And I was looking around for a way to um, provide some sort of educational service or community service uh, just as a part of my practice and my spiritual practice. I wanted to do something and this is what I know how to do. In early 2009, the club spent two weeks at Lucy Reed so that all 550 children could participate. Anything hands-on with four-year-olds is very important. They need tangible things. So getting to play in soil, getting to water, and to have a responsibility of, you know, taking care of something that's their very own is very important. And they're very excited because they've never had that chance before. The idea of starting at that age with, at four years old in pre-K, it never occurred to me but it just is, is exactly the right age for them to learn that type of hands-on experience of seeing what happens when you combine soil, air, water, and a bulb, and then give it a little nurturing, and this incredible beauty comes from that. You know, that's the kind of lesson I hope, uh, I feel like they will carry with them at some point inside of them and carry that through life with them. We really wanted the children to have some background knowledge about tulips before we began, and he was very excited about that because part of his program is he really wants to see the process of the learning, which we are very in tune to here at the school because science is a major focus for Lucy Reed. Of this bulb, this flower already exists like a little tiny baby. Do you see those? Those are the roots. They've already grown all the way and they're growing through the bottom of the pot. Then look what happens. Lucy Reed includes gardening in their science program as first lessons in botany. Since many children live in apartments, community engagement with Eager extends the mission to connect children to the earth. It's pretty clear the part they like best. Okay. I, hear, I hear clamoring for water. Okay, who's next? For the Texas Flower Bulb Society volunteers, Handing down their knowledge is just part of what they like best. And I think once somebody volunteers in and sits at the table, around the table with those kids, I think it's addictive. Just that positive vibe, that the, the, seeing the children learning and having that experience. I think more than words, uh, just the smiles you know, on their faces and the happiness that I see. It's not just us going there to do something for the children. We're going there to do something for ourselves. 
Oh, it's always great to see children out in the garden. Thanks for sharing that space with us. Right now we're going to be visiting with Chris Weisinger from Southern Bulb Company. It's been a few years since you've been on the program, Chris, but welcome back. Thank you. You've been on an adventure, I know, because you started out as a bulb hunter, trying to bring rare southern species back to the market, and uh, you got quite a splash of attention when you started off. Now you've been uh, uh, operating out of East Texas for the past four years, bringing all these wonderful bulbs back to us. How's, how's the business been? It, it's been exciting. Um, it's less bulb hunting these days and more answering emails and farming. <laughs> um, but four years, you learn a lot. Yeah. It's, been, it's still an adventure every day. And you're, you're, you're growing plants that uh, there's so much, I think, romantic attachment and personal attachment that people have to bulbs. I don't know why it is that people have that kind of personal, kind of story-like relationship with bulb plants, but it seems to be the case. Yeah, well, one is that they, you know, they'll come back year after year, mm -hmm. even if you forget about them. They're like old friends. They keep popping in your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a seasonal reminder, special things and events. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, they, I think that's a really special quality about them. And there are, you know, I, I grew up in the Northeast. Uh, we had lots of bulb plants up there. People move down here, they assume that th that's part of their past. Yeah. But there are a lot of really good performers. There, there really are, mm -hmm. you know. And I see them whenever I venture out of the red cabin mm -hmm. to go bulb hunting. You see them all over these old country roads and old home sites. And mm -hmm. now you're seeing them a lot more in some of the, the urban gardens. Yeah, well, and in my garden for sure, some of the things we're going to be talking about today are some of my favorite plants in the garden. Uh, especially the fall bloomers. Uh, uh, this time of year, one of my favorite things is we get that first heavy shower in September, sometimes even in late August, and here come the oxblood lilies and the lycoris, and it's kind of magical. Very magical, and especially when we have dry years like this, mm -hmm. it'll just be completely brown, and one good rain, and this uh, patch of oxblood, you know, dark red will just pop out, mm -hmm. and just the contrast against the brown mm -hmm. reminds you that uh, there's beautiful things that are just lying silent to the ground, yeah. and that summer's almost over, and fall's almost yeah. here. Yeah, that's really special. Let's focus in on the oxbloods for a little while here. You're holding one of the bulbs right there. I use these a lot in my garden, and they they perform year after year after year. Uh, beautiful shows of red, sometimes pink flowers as well, mm -hmm. and uh, they really seem super xeric and hardy. Yeah, well, they are, and the nice thing about them is that you don't have to irrigate them at, at all, and mm -hmm. um, they are super hardy, and they propagate very very fast. I yeah. mean. There's a little baby right there. I uh -huh. mean, it's probably a little too early, but yeah. you leave them in the ground, and in a few years, one will turn into a clump. So you oh, really yeah. don't need a big start. Yeah, yeah. You, it, it's amazing how fast they divide, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I started with a few dozen in my garden, and now I know dozens and dozens and dozens. You yeah. Know, so. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about them is that even if we have a dry year, they'll still bloom for you. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't ever really skip. It might not mm -hmm. be the best show if it's mm -hmm. extremely dry, but they're going to send up their trumpet-shaped, uh, dark red uh, flowers mm -hmm. to let you know they're there. Yeah, well, it's just a, a super plant. People call them oxblood lilies. They're also sometimes called schoolyard lilies, I've heard. Yes. Again, and uh, that's, I guess, a reference to the fact that bloom when people are going back to school in September. Yeah, so children might not like to see them blooming, <laughs> um, but for, maybe parents like to see them blooming. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, no, they're a beautiful splash of dark red in, in the in the yeah. late summer. And actually, a tiny amaryllis, isn't it? Yeah, it's an amaryllid, um, yeah. uh, Rhodophyllus is the genus name, but yeah, it's yeah. a little mini amaryllis. Yeah. Well, uh, at the very same time, we get the Lycoris, uh, or spider lilies, another name for these. Uh, and these are a dramatic flair to the flower. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, and it looks like a spider-like flower mm -hmm. with its little legs just, I mean, shooting out and little yellow tips mm -hmm. uh, on the end of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, a nice red, almost a coral red. Yeah. Um, the beautiful color. Yeah. Beautiful color, and uh, the, some people call them surprise lilies because they right. just surprise you and mm -hmm. get you there. Now, there are other forms of Lycoris, but this is the one, the radiata, that really just seems to perform for us down here. The radiata seems to be the best from Austin, you know, all the way to the East Coast. Yeah. Um, and um, some people call them British soldiers. You see them marching the tension <laughs> in British red coats. So yeah, yeah, that's a good. I have not. That's a, a new one for me. I've never heard that, but. 
Again, one of my absolute favorites, and uh, that orange-red color is, I think, my favorite color in the garden, actually. And uh, the form of this bloom is great, and the foliage of this bloom is attractive during the wintertime, It's too. attractive during the wintertime, and you can mix it in with other things like liriope mm -hmm. uh, or daylilies, and they're just wonderful complements to each other. Yeah. Um, the problem is if it's a really dry year, sometimes they're going to skip a bloom. Mm -hmm. But um, don't fear, they're going to bloom eventually. Just let them get established and they'll come back in a good wet year. Just a, a great tough plant. Now, uh, the rain lily family is one that does terrifically well for us here in Austin. Uh, generally, these are plants that come in what we, is the, the botanical name is the Zephranthes. Mm -hmm. um, and you've been growing a, a number of different forms of these. These really are tough little guys. Yeah, yeah, they are. Rain lilies are a lot of fun. They are small, so when you see them, you know, you, you might think, well, gosh, they're not a huge bulb. Right. Um, but rain lilies are gonna uh, survive, they're gonna propagate very fast, and they're gonna mm -hmm. give you, the, some bloom in early summer, midsummer, but there's also a couple that bloom great in the late mm -hmm. summer, early fall. Yeah, and uh, you you grow one variety, it's La Bufarosa. Is La that... Bufarosa, right. Yeah. Um, sometimes we just say a pink green lily yeah, and then let folks right. work out the scientific name on their own. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's a beautiful uh, pink flower. And this is a big one too. This is, you know, some of them are, are truly tiny little blooms, but this right. one's kind of showy. It is kind of showy and there's different different selections of it, mm -hmm. um, but it's showy, it's pink, it opens up nice for you. Mm -hmm. The foliage is strong and so just a repeat bloomer mm -hmm. and um, people just love to see it blooming in the field. Yeah. And I, I went away on a speaking engagement once and everything was dormant and I came back and it rained while I was gone. It's just an explosion of pink from these these nice little rain Yeah, I, I re this is one of my favorite plants, and I, I, I like to recommend that people who have, uh, I have a lot of beds in my garden that are very xeric, that are with a lot of sculptural plants like agaves and yuccas and things like that, and mixing these in around that is really perfect because they show up. They're not in a, in a perennial bed. They get kind of crowded out. Mm -hmm. They're buried by other plants. But in a real kind of zen-like bed, they pop up. They make this beautiful show. They really catch your attention, and mm -hmm. then they just disappear. Yeah, you know, yeah. just to, just to pop back up a few weeks later after another rain, possibly. So you, right, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really great. Now you also have candida. Is that Can candida? It, yeah. Candida. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's it's a white rain lily. It's mm -hmm. a little more open. Um, mm -hmm. I like the white ones too. Yeah. I like them a, mm -hmm. a lot. And they start late summer and they'll bloom into the early fall for us. Uh -huh. And they love boggy, wet conditions. You know, mm -hmm. I actually grow them in my pond on the farm, completely uh -huh. submerged underwater. See, I've never heard, I can't imagine one actually growing in water. Bulbs and water don't seem to go to he together in my head. I but, know, I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing little rain lily. And it propagates and it just keeps on blooming. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to try some in the bog section of my pond. Yeah, I do. Yeah. You might like it. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right. Well, rain lilies again are great. Great one. Um, my favorite memory as a child was uh, tulips blooming in the spring. Mm -hmm. As it was like the moment, you know, it was like the perfect spring moment was when they they came up in the garden. Unfortunately, the Dutch tulips down here kind of not so good. <laughs> Some of them are fine if you want them as an annual. Oh, right. You want to put them in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, when people think bulbs, they automatically think tulips. Right. I mean, I give a lot of speaking engagements, and mm -hmm. I tell somebody I grow bulbs. Yeah. And they turn to their friend and says, he grows tulips. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I've had to learn a lot about tulips, and there are some species tulips mm -hmm. that will come back uh, yeah. for a long time, especially mm -hmm. here in Austin when it gets a little drier in the summer. Yeah. Um, uh, Tulipa clusiana, the clusiana tulips, right. like the Lady Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful uh, white and pink mm -hmm. uh, variation in the bloom. They're a little bit of a smaller, smaller Again, bloom. Right. Um, but the mass of color and the, just a pop of color that they mm -hmm. give you in the spring, that mm -hmm. vibrance uh, yeah. is just eye-catching yeah. out of the world. They're they're really delicate little blooms, and uh, for those people, and I'm one. Of, I like to photograph my garden, and getting in close mm -hmm. on these guys, they're exquisite little flowers, and I use them in the same way that I use rain lilies. I put them in a bed where they'll pop up and be showy, where it's kind of spare around them, and then the, again they'll go down and be dormant. And I've had pretty good luck with mine coming back now for a few years in a row, so I'm, I keep my fingers crossed through this drought. I've know. had them for four years up uh, north of Tyler, and it's yeah. much more humid up there. And yeah, they've done, they've done just fine for me. Good. So good. Well, uh, uh, the Clusiana tulips—that's generally the rule. And there are a couple of other names. There's Lady yeah, Jane. There's Lady Jane. There's Tinka. Tinka, which is okay. a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuberigen's Jim. Okay. Um, it's just. 
a really rich color. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, you know, don't make them the focal point, make them an accent. Yeah, right, right. So yeah. uh, uh, people really should consider those. The other plant that everybody thinks about when they think of bulbs are the narcissus, yeah. you know, daffodils yeah. and the little jonquils and things like that. So um, there are a couple of varieties that you grow as well that you've had good success in the south and that's a tricky thing, I think. It is a tricky thing and after doing this for four years, mm -hmm. four years now, uh, I, I deal with a lot of customers and they let me know when things don't come back. Yeah. And I almost never get a complaint about the Narcissus Grand Primo. Okay. Um, it comes back. It blooms for mm -hmm. three weeks solid because mm -hmm. one little bulb like this will send up two to three blooms. And that's not a little bulb. That's a beauty, by the way. It's a beauty bulb. <laughs> it, I'm getting your floor all dirty, but it really that's... just polishes off nice, too. I, I'm a true bulb lover. I like them when they're out of the ground, too. But Yeah. Um, that is a solid bulb, mm -hmm. and it's the Grand Primo. It, you know, it's almost a staple that belongs in every every garden in yeah. Texas. And when you, and these are a small uh, b uh, bloom with a yellow cup and uh, white petals, right? Mm -hmm. And th that strong narcissus fragrance. The strong narcissus fragrance cut a little bit by that yellow cup. It's not going to be as potent mm -hmm. as a paper white might okay. be. Okay. So it's a little more sweet. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. The, when the paper whites bloom in my garden, you can. All, you can smell them literally from the other side of the garden. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. And this one, you know, comes up about a foot tall, and it's right. like popcorn of small little flowers. I'm yeah. Like and say. but again, really showy, and it's nice to have the yellow. That's what I always think of when I think of narcissus. I want some yellow. You want some yellow. And you also have golden dawn, right? Yeah, and that is yellow for mm -hmm. for you. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yellow cups and yellow petals, mm -hmm. almost golden. Um, yeah. And it has a very sweet fragrance, almost a jonquil fragrance. Okay. Yeah. So these are all things that you're growing on your farm. Yes. People can be in touch with you on the web. Yes, at southernbulbs.com. Okay. Or Google Bulb Hunter, and I'll pop up. Yeah. <laughs> bulb yeah. Hunter. Bulb Hunter. It's still, I still own the red cabin. I'm still out there hunting and farming bulbs. So that, that is such a cool thing. And <laughs> you, we've, we've had rose rustlers and bulb hunters <laughs> on the show. And uh, following your dream of, of reintroducing these plants to people, I think it's really exciting that you're, you're doing it. And again, these are, these are sentimental garden favorites for a reason, as you said. You know, they come back dependably year after year, signals of the season, mm -hmm. and you're uh, keeping that alive for a lot of folks. That's wonderful. Thank you, Tom. All yeah. right. Well, thanks for being again our guest here on Central Texas Gardener. It's Southern Bulb Company. Uh, Southernbulbs.com. Southern Southernbulbs.com. Southern Bulbs. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Coming up next, it's Daphne with Down to Earth. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's plant is passion vine. If you've noticed in your garden that you don't have many summer bloomers, this would be a great one for you to choose. It's also a great plant for butterflies, which can be a positive and a negative. We all love butterflies in our garden, but we don't realize sometimes that to have those butterflies, we have to have a food source for the larvae or the caterpillar. The particular caterpillar that we have that loves this plant is called the Gulf fritillary. There are many species of butterfly that love this plant, and it is a host plant for the larvae of that. So if you've seen some um, red and black fuzzy spiny caterpillars on this plant, and your plant is very young, you might want to take off some of those caterpillars in order to leave uh, in order for your plant not to get completely eaten to the ground. And if you planted a young one and then had it completely decimated in just a few days, you know what I'm talking about. This particular plant is very vining and it does cascade, so it needs trellis support. If you have a trellis, you can put it on or a fence or even just tack it to a wall. If you have a wall that you want to support it, that will be very helpful for this, for this plant. Is it, it is vining, but it doesn't vine along the ground as some vines do, so it does need support. Our question this week is about grasshoppers. We've been getting a lot of questions about grasshoppers, and that's because grasshoppers are very active in dry, hot weather. So as you well know, we've had a lot of dry, hot weather lately, and so grasshoppers have been more active than they have been in past years. Unfortunately, once the grasshopper adults infest your area, it's really too late for any chemical controls, and the only good solution is a physical barrier. You could get row covers to put on your plants. You could cover them with a thin um, physical barrier to help protect them that doesn't um, touch the plant too much and create a fungal situation. You can also plant grasshopper-resistant plants, which include American Beautyberry, 
the beautiful lantanas, and then your cherry sage or your autumn sage is also a good plant. Then if you want a ground cover that's grasshopper resistant, you might try purslane. This month in your garden, there is a lot to do. We're getting into the fall and there is so much to do in your garden. Because we live in such a great climate, we can garden all year round here. We don't have many frost nights here in the central Texas area. So you can actually plant some flowers such as mums. Those are fall flowering plants. And it's time to plant wildflower seeds such as Indian blanket and blue bonnets. And I want to remind everyone that there is a maroon blue bonnet, not a great name for it. It's an Aggie maroon. It was developed at Texas A&M and that's also a beautiful uh, choice. You can plant calendula now, petunias and pansies are our cooler season flowers, and then also penstemon. On the penstemon, do be careful of the soil. It does like well-drained soil and it may rot if you're not careful. It's also time to plant some great cool season vegetables. If you're not planting from transplants, you may be careful. If you plant from seeds right now, you are going to have to protect those seedlings through our winter nights that are coming up. Down in the 40s will even damage some of these seedlings. So you need to be prepared with some row covers. But if you're planting transplants, you're gonna have much better luck, such as carrot. It's a great time for onions. Those should be planted from seed right now. And also your broccoli, your cabbage, your radishes, and your beets. Then there are several herbs you can look at. It's very easy to get a quick, a quick crop of those. Lemon balm, cilantro, otherwise known as coriander, and also rosemary and sage. For more plant tips and to contact your extension office, please visit klru.org ctg. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. Austin Spa, we have a long tradition of having pumpkin decorating contests for Halloween, and the grounds department does a little bit different twist. We decorate with natural elements that are growing here in the grounds. Onyx, my black cat here, and I are going to show you around at some of our pumpkins. This pumpkin is decorated with bamboo legs, and the legs are covered with purple fountain grass plumes. The body of the pumpkin has gulf muley seed heads. And we've got mountain laurel seed pods, as well as some gourds and some black pearl pepper berries for eyes. So lots of uh, native plants and natural elements used in the pumpkin's face. We use a drill to make the holes where we're going to be putting things like the legs and the eyes. Just makes it easier. And then we use a glue gun and a glue pan to fit those in. And sometimes we use uh, sticks to uh, affix them to the pumpkin. What's nice when you do that kind of thing where you're making small openings in the pumpkin is the pumpkins tend to last a lot longer than if you make large openings in the pumpkin. Here we've taken a pumpkin and decorated it from the side, put another pumpkin in front, use pomegranates for the eyes with black pearl peppers, and we have Esperanza seed pods for the mouth parts and trumpet creeper seed pods for the legs. We did spray paint on the body and then we used some Peruvian purple and black pearl peppers to make the spots for the ladybug. And a pepper for the mouth. This is our turkey pumpkin. This could take you all the way into Thanksgiving. And we've taken the pumpkin and made some small holes with an electric drill and stuck in some plumes of pampas grass for the wings and the tail. And we also covered the body of the turkey with pampas grass plumes. Then we used celosia for the uh, wattle on the head and underneath. We used peppers for the eyes and gourds for the face. Imagine having this lovely lady gracing your front porch. She's got hair made from Mexican feather grass and purple fountain grass plumes. She's got a lovely headband made with marigolds and mums. And she's got bur oak acorns for eyes colored in with nail polish. She does have an unfortunate case of warts made from purple and red peppers, and she's got some very interesting dental work 
and those are ahi lemon peppers and uh, various Peruvian purple peppers. She has Datura seed pod ears with some Esperanza seed pod earrings. When it's time for you to decorate your next jack-o'-lantern, you might want to take a walk out on the yard first and look at seeds and berries and grass heads and all kinds of wonderful textures and elements in your yard that might be useful for decorating your very unique jack-o'-lantern. Visit klru.org ctg for more tips, online video, and our weekly blog. Next week, find out how to start wildflowers. Until then, I'll see you in the garden.